Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Logos Project. This is your host, Dom. And in today's video, I'm joined once again by John Salza to continue our series on the Society of St. Pius X. John, how are you doing today? Good, Dom. Thanks for having me. Anytime. Well, as usual, John, for any newcomers, could you give us a brief in, um, introduction as to who you are and what your work is? Sure. Uh, for everybody, I'm a Catholic author and apologist. Uh, I've been in that business for 20, going on 25 years. I've written a dozen books uh, on the Catholic faith, primarily apologetics in the area of doctrine and, and explanation of the, of the faith to, to our non-Catholic friends. Uh, I'm a practicing lawyer and an advocate for my clients, and I'm also a, a lay Dominican of the central province for St. Albert the Great. So great to be with you. Excellent. Well, good to have you again, John. And uh, today, so we've, you know, we've produced uh, several videos on the Society of St. Pius X, and uh, we've um, uh, asked for feedback, and uh, we have gotten some, but not the greatest feedback. Uh, however, the Society did publish an article on their website, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. And it's written by Father Glaze. Is that how you pronounce it, John? Yeah, I believe Father Jean-Michel Glees, yes. Glees, okay, excellent. Well, so John, let's just kick this off. And um, what is going on with this uh, latest article from Father Glees uh, and the Society? Well, I think, Tom, this is a very significant uh, development because the Society has just published this article by, by Father Glees, and it's refined its positions on the consecrations of 88. And don't forget, by the way, there was an illicit consecration in 91 as well replacing Bishop Castro de Meyer. Um, this is extremely significant. I think, first of all, it's it's in response to the work that we've done this past year. Uh, we have shown from the teachings of councils, including the Council of Trent, and as most recently as, as Pius XII, uh, the church has always taught that bishops who are illicitly consecrated and who carry out a mission, you know, without a canonical determination by the Catholic Church, Pius XII calls them thieves and robbers, he says their, their acts are criminal and sacrilegious, and there's no state of necessity that could ever justify this. Well, evidently, Father Glees and the Society uh, thought it best to attempt to at least confront the teachings of Pius XII in an attempt to distinguish their situation from those condemnations. And frankly, it has backfired on them uh, in, in a most dramatic way. And I mm -hmm. think this is extremely important for our readers and our viewership to understand because the Society of St. Pius X, this article was just issued, uh, the mm -hmm. English translation on the Society website on September 22nd, 2022, so just a little over a month ago. The Society has reduced uh, this question uh, down to one single issue. And I'm talking about the consecrations of 88. They've reduced it to a single question. And that question is, is the right to select bishops a right, a divine right, a divine prerogative of the primacy? Is it a yeah. right of the Pope alone? If the answer to that question is yes, then by the society's own admission, the consecrations are schismatic, period. And what makes this significant, Dom, is because Father Glees admits in this article that usurping a right of the primacy is necessarily schismatic and no state of necessity or emergency or crisis justifies it. Mm -hmm. He already concedes the principle at play here. And hence, if we can show that the right to select bishops and then consecrate them belongs to the Pope alone, there's nothing left of the society's position. It's a game over moment for the SSPX. Gotcha. So in other words, the 1988 consecrations of Archbishop Lefebvre, um, Father Glees, uh, agrees that if these consecrations uh, usurp the right that belongs to the primacy, then they are schismatic. But now he's going to try to get around this by making a distinction between, and you'll get into this, yes. two aspects of those consecrations. So my next question for you is uh, how does the SSPX attempt to get around the truth that it is the Pope's divine and exclusive right to select bishops for consecration? Sure. Well, we can frame it by saying a couple things. First of all, Father Glees makes a devastating admission here. Okay? okay. He admits that usurping a divine right which belongs to the Pope alone is a schismatic act. He concedes that. Okay. He then makes the fatal theological error 
of failing to recognize <laughs> that the, the right to select bishops is such a divine right of the primacy which belongs to the Pope alone. And it's a matter of divine law, as I will prove. And I've just released an article uh, on this, and I have all of the quotations from the magisterium on this. This is not my opinion. This is the perennial teaching of the church. And therefore, because Archbishop Lefebvre usurped this right of the primacy by selecting bishops against the will of the Holy Father, and then going on to consecrate those bishops against the will of the Holy Father, he committed a schismatic act by Father Glees' own admission, since he concedes the principle. So what the society does, Don, Don in this article, to answer your questions, is they attempt to get around what I just uh, said about the, the consecrations in two ways. The, the first argument that Father Glees advances is that he says, because Archbishop Lefebvre did not intend to confer jurisdiction, but only Episcopal orders, the act is not schismatic. Now, there are two replies to that. That's completely false. Number one, because Archbishop Lefebvre did intend to confer, and the society bishops actually claim to have a type of jurisdiction, not just applied jurisdiction, as I will prove, but, but they do claim to have an Episcopal jurisdiction, what, what they call an extraordinary jurisdiction. So Father Glees' claim that the society didn't intend to assume jurisdiction is factually inaccurate. But secondly, that's irrelevant because even if Lefebvre didn't intend to confer jurisdiction, he still usurped the Pope's divine right to select bishops, okay, mm -hmm. which is a divine right that the primacy alone holds, and hence the act is still schismatic. The, the second thing Father Glees does in the article is he claims that the consecrations were not schismatic because a bishop has the ability to confer uh, orders, okay? It's not just the Pope alone who can actually consecrate, but a bishop can. And so he, he concludes that because a bishop has the, the metaphysical ability to confer the sacramental character, that the act is not schismatic. Now, that, that's absolutely absurd. He's failing to distinguish between a bishop's ability to confer the sacramental character and the bishop's right to do so. The bishop, of course, has no divine right to consecrate another bishop against the will of the pope, even if he has, of course, the meta metaphysical ability to confer Episcopal orders, to confer the sacramental uh, Episcopal character. And again, we say that usurping the Pope's divine right to select bishops in the first place is a divine right of the primacy. So in short, Don, because the SSPX concedes that usurping a divine right of the Pope is schismatic, and the mm -hmm. fact that they have failed to recognize that the selection of bishops is a right of the primacy alone, the consecrations in 88 and 91, by their own admission, are schismatic. Okay, yeah, so to reiterate, basically, Father Glees distinguishes between the possibility, because one is a bishop, to consecrate other bishops versus the right to do so. And that right, by divine law, not ecclesiastical law, which we'll get into, yeah. by divine law, belongs solely to the primacy. And so whether he can do it or not is beside the point. What is the point is, is he allowed to do it or not against the right of the primacy? Is that correct? Dom, that's correct. And it is astonishing that Father Glees, a seminary professor in the SSPX, completely overlooks the Pope's divine right to select a bishop to perpetuate formal apostolic succession, which is an issue of ecclesiology. It's an issue of the divine constitution of the church, and instead zero in on a bishop's mere ability to confer orders, which is an issue of sacramental theology. It, 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 you know, it's, 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 it's astonishing that he would make that error, but that is exactly his error. And he does say, because a bishop's ability to confer Episcopal orders is a theological possibility. He says, mm -hmm. therefore, the act cannot be schismatic. Whereas a pope's ability to confer jurisdiction would be theologically impossible for other bishops. He then acknowledges that, well, the usurpation of a conferral of jurisdiction is schismatic because it can't happen. But yeah. uh, the usurpation of consecration is not schismatic because a bishop has the ability to confer Episcopal orders. 
It's totally yeah. absurd. There's an error in logic there. And moreover, it's contrary to the teaching of the magisterium. So according to Father Glees, the consecrations would have been schismatic if Archbishop Lefebvre had intended to confer jurisdiction. But Father Glees says, however, that's impossible because to do so, you need the approval of the Pope. And so he's saying Lefebvre merely consecrated them without giving them jurisdiction. And that is not usur usurping or, or, you know, or schismatic because he's merely doing something he can. It's, it does sound quite ridiculous to me. Yeah. Yeah. It, so, it, again, it overlooks the, the rights of, of the primacy. Uh, yes. Com completely. Okay. So let's get more into the, uh, the argument here in, in our, um, our sources. Uh, so what about the objection that the process of nominating bishops is a matter of ecclesiastical law and not divine law? Could you open that up for us? Sure. Uh, there, there are a couple of replies to, to that. Um, first of all, the popes have already addressed this. Uh, and I, I point this out in my article, for example, Pius IX. Uh, it is true that the nomination process of bishops, the process, which has changed throughout the centuries, and it's changed both throughout the East and the West. The process, would, would we could say, is in the realm of discipline. Mm -hmm. But the process itself has to be approved by the Pope because the Pope is the supreme authority even on matters of discipline. And as Pius IX clearly taught, he condemned the Armenian heretics who were illicitly consecrating bishops against the, the will of the Holy Father um, when they were ignoring the process that the Pope approved. And the Pope says their failure to submit even to the ecclesiastical process of the Pope's approval uh, is contrary. He says contrary to divine law and heretical because he said it was divinely revealed uh, by Christ and Vatican I taught this definitively that all are subject to the supreme authority of the Pope even on matters of discipline, you see? So that yes. argument falls flat on its face but ultimately, though, Dom, there's a distinction between the process and the ultimate decision, okay? The process, yes. of course, has to be approved by the Holy Father. There have been cases throughout history where, you know, synods, regional synods, you know, produced a list of three bishops, and the Holy Father says, I choose this one, or I approve the one you chose, or in the case of the Armenians, I reject all three, and I'm going to choose another one. And they went ahead and consecrated, which was illicit, and they were excommunicated to schismatics. Uh, but, but the ultimate decision is a matter of divine law, as we're going to see, because the popes have taught that Christ gave this right to select bishops exclusively to Peter and to the mm -hmm. office of the papacy. Why is that? Well, Christ created, we could say, two offices. He created the office of the primacy, and then he created the office of the episcopate, which we would call the College of Bishops. The primacy, the Pope, by virtue of his office, is the head of the college, and therefore he has the divine right to determine who becomes a member of that divine office of College of Bishops. You see, no bishop can ever become a member of the College of Bishops against the head, the will of the head of the College of Bishops. It's, it's impossible and it's an absurdity. So that shows yeah. that, you know, just as Christ chose and sent his apostles. So the vicar of Christ chooses and sends the successors to the apostles. This is a matter of divine law. Any bishop who would usurp the Pope's right to select bishops is a schismatic by the perennial teaching of the Catholic Church. And as Father Glee says, anyone who arrogates to himself the authority of the Supreme Pontiff is a schismatic. And that's why this is a game yeah. over moment for the Society of St. Pius X. So um, I like how you distinguish between ecclesiastical process and divine law, divine right. And this is the key here. You know, there have been times where the process involved bishops consecrating, not maybe, you know, with the explicit approval of the pontiff, but with the tacit acceptance into the college, right? And so, I mean, you said this, I think, um, you said the inferior is received by the superior. The inferior Always. doesn't decide to enter into the college against the superior's will. How, if that's the case, how would the, the Pope be the head of the college? 
That doesn't exactly. make sense. Exactly, Don. The Council of Trent teaches that bishops are assumed by the Holy Father, which means the Holy Father must receive the bishops into communion. Okay, mm -hmm. Our faithful traditional Catholics must understand that it is not sufficient for a bishop or a priest to simply name Francis in the canon of the Mass. That does not put him in communion with the Holy Father. The Holy Father must receive the bishops and bring the bishops into the collegial communion, into the college of bishops, and give them authority that way. Otherwise, as, as, as Pius XII said, they're thieves and robbers. They're thieves yeah. because they're usurping a right of the primacy and the robbers because they're effectively trafficking in, in spiritual goods. I mean, this is, this is the teaching mm -hmm. throughout the history of the church. In other words, like St. Eusebius or even um, uh, uh, Wotiwa, uh, John Paul II, when he was a bishop, those consecrations, I mean, there's no letter from the Vatican saying we do not accept these. These are we, we refuse these consecrations. You are not part of the college. You know, these are accepted by the Roman pontiff. But in the case of Lefebvre, they were told before the consecrations and after that this was not accepted. And so to say that John Paul II, uh, when he was a bishop, his consecrations were a disobedient act against the Pope, I would say produce the documents. That's ridiculous. And well, that, the Holy in See fact, acknowledged them, Dom. The Holy See eventually acknowledged that the consecrations yes. that Cardinal Slippage and, and, and Cardinal Waitiwa did behind the Iron Curtain in a state of persecution were accepted by the Holy See. And, and exactly. Hence, but we have the same thing in, in, in the case of Lefebvre, where the Holy See warned canonically not to select those bishops and not to move forward with the consecrations, and they did, which resulted in the excommunication. So it's apples and oranges. Yes, and I bring this up, John, because we've been accused of uh, uh, calumniating basically uh, a, a bishop and, and judging his actions. While they say this about uh, Bishop Wotiwa, you, you see the the double standard here. It's quite uh, astonishing. Anyway, let's let's move forward. Um, Let's see here. Can you address in more detail, John, the um, uh, Father Glaze's claim that the 88 consecrations were not schismatic because Lefebvre did not intend to confer jurisdiction? Yeah, I'll quote Father Glaze here. He says this. He says, Archbishop Lefebvre did not intend to arrogate to himself the authority of the Supreme Pontiff. Notice he's recognizing that would be a problem in order to communicate a power of jurisdiction to the four bishops. He was content to communicate to them the power of order by means of sacred rite of Episcopal consecration. This distinction is possible theologically, he says, as we showed in light of the teachings of Pius XII. Well, here again uh, is Father Gleese's failure to recognize that the right to select the bishops, as well as the right to consecrate and the right to give canonical mission, all of these rights are prerogatives of the primacy and rest with, with Peter and his successors alone. But what it reveals, Dom, even before we get into the quotes from the society themselves, which show that they have assumed the type of jurisdiction, I would say that if Father Glees is claiming that Archbishop Lefebvre intended to only communicate orders and not jurisdiction, this would reveal Lefebvre having a profound ignorance or understanding of, of, of the episcopate itself. Because the, the episcopate is, is ordered to, to governance. And if we step back, we can, we can look at some of the teachings, for example, of St. Thomas Aquinas, where he says that while a simple priest is ordered to sanctification, primarily to, to confect the, the body of Christ in the Eucharist, St. Yeah. Thomas says that a bishop is ordered primarily to governance, right, mm -hmm. to the mystical body of Christ. As the Council of Trent declared, the bishops have been, quote, placed by the Holy Ghost to rule the Church of God. And so a Catholic bishop is first and foremost ordered to ecclesiastical governance for which, what, for which jurisdiction is required, you see? I mean, the Episcopal consecration, it, that gives him supplementary powers to perfect his mission, to give him the fullness of the priesthood, but a bishop is primarily ordered to govern through jurisdiction. And so any anticipated Episcopal consecration for a bishop necessarily contemplates the related yeah. canonical mission and jurisdiction that goes along with it. And so if, if Father Glees is saying that Lefebvre was content to only communicate the power of orders, it shows a completely perverted understanding of what the Episcopate is. Um, and so, you know, 
it, it doesn't it doesn't add up with the Catholic theology. Yeah. The, the 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 jurisdiction and the consecration and what's conferred in 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 conferring canonical mission. I mean, these are two interdependent powers, right? That can't be separated from each other. It's never the case where a bishop would say, "I'm only intending to confer orders, but not jurisdiction." That's contrary to the whole nature of the episcopate. In in other words, what I'm hearing you say, John, is that episcopal orders and jurisdiction can be distinguished but not separated because of the very nature of the episcopate and so the claim that lefebvre is not intending to confer jurisdiction not only is proven false from what we see subsequently as well as from what we see from archbishop lefebvre's words but by the very nature of an episcopal ordination is that correct christ chooses to send he chooses yeah. to send. He doesn't choose and then not send his, his, his apostles, right? So the apostles were first chosen by Christ. They were consecrated by Christ. And then they were given the juridical mission by Christ, as Pius XII calls it. So all yeah. of those powers are interdependent and, and dependent upon each other. And ultimately, of course, dependent upon Peter. Just as they depended upon Christ, they now depend upon the vicar of Christ. And so they can't be separated or bifurcated. That itself is is schism. Excellent, yeah. And this is why we see how the the primacy is so necessary for genuine unity. Uh, you can't have the unity of the College of the Bishops without the 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 right of the primacy, the divine right of the primacy. Excellent. Um, okay, so we basically covered Father Gleese's uh, fundamental error concerning Episcopal consecration. Um, maybe let's turn to the magisterium and whether it teaches that the selection of bishops is a divine right of the primacy. Let's maybe get into some of the sources, uh, John. We, could, we, we certainly can do that. Um, did you want to address some of the uh, yeah. issues on jurisdictional first? Because there's more we could say about that. Remember, I, I want to back up what I'm claiming because no, absolutely. Father, Glee, yeah, Fa Father Glees said that Lefebvre didn't intend to confer jurisdiction. Okay. Now, that's irrelevant because Lefebvre usurped a right of the primacy in selecting bishops against the will of the Holy Father. So it's irrelevant. But I want to prove that that statement is factually inaccurate as well. I think it's very yeah. important. And I, I say that because I'm going to first quote Father Gleese, who said this time. He said in the article I'm referring to, quote, mm -hmm. schism consists precisely in refusing as a matter of principle to subordinate one's action to the precept of the authority and to separate oneself from it so as to set oneself up as a competing authority, end quote. Yeah. So again, Father Glees is correctly conceding that usurping a right of the, of the authority of the primacy would be schismatic. And an mm -hmm. example of that would be setting oneself up as a competing authority. So we must ask the question, did Lefebvre set up the society as a competing authority with the Roman Catholic Church? Well, right. let's see what, what Archbishop Lefebvre said about that. I'm quoting Lefebvre. He said, quote, as long as the present Roman authorities are imbued with ecumenism and modernism, as long as their decisions and the new code of canon law are influenced by these false principles, it will be necessary to establish substitute authorities faithfully keeping the Catholic principles of Catholic tradition and Catholic law. Well, there you go. Lefebvre intended to erect yeah. a tribunal to act as, in Father Gleese's word, words, a competing authority with the legitimate authorities of the Catholic Church. And this is what happened. This is exactly what happened, as the society now says. They have the authority to judge you know, marriage cases, to grant dispensations for mixed marriages and issue declarations of nullity, lift ecclesiastical mm -hmm. censures, including excommunications, dispense from religious vows, authorize exorcisms and all the rest of it without any ecclesiastical approval whatsoever. And, and, and we can go on and see what the society says about their own tribunals. And you know this, Dom, it requires its adherence yeah. to swear in the gospels that quote, I will conform myself to the verdict of the tribunal, not to approach an official ecclesiastical tribunal, end quote, which the society, as you also know, calls novus oral tribunals. Right. And, and they're advising their people to never advise anyone to go to a novus oral, tri, a novus oral tri, tribunal. tribunal. Yeah. And, and so, you know, they've set this tribunal up as a, as a competing authority. I mean, if you even look at uh, some of the things that Bishop Tissier said, he does say that our verdicts are true verdicts. They have mm -hmm. true jurisdiction. 
They're matters of binding and loosing. And he specifically says that their verdicts replace those of the Roman Rhoda. Replace those of the Roman Rhoda. Now, if that's not a competing authority, I don't know what is. Of course, yeah. it's a competing authority because the society is telling its own people, you do not have a right to go to Catholic tribunals. You don't have a right to go to them. They're modernist. They're dangerous. You have to come to us. This is clearly a competing authority. And again, because Father Glees has conceded that if the society were to set itself up as a competing authority, they'd be schismatic. Well, Father Glees has just dug the society's own grave with these admissions because that's exactly yeah. what they've done. And so in this, they wouldn't consider a supplied jurisdiction like for confessions and marriage. This they consider as a different kind of jurisdiction since they have a tribunal. What kind of jurisdiction do they call this? Well, let's listen to what Bishop Fillet says about that. I'm going to quote him. He says, quote, the bishops of the society, though deprived of any territorial jurisdiction, nevertheless possess the supplatory jurisdiction necessary to exercise the powers attached to the Episcopal order and, I repeat, and certain acts of ordinary Episcopal jurisdiction, end quote. Well, there you go. Filet yeah. makes a distinction between supplied jurisdiction and ordinary Episcopal jurisdiction. Now, Father Glees has admitted that if Archbishop Lefebvre intended to confer an Episcopal jurisdiction through the consecrations, his consecrations would have been schismatic. And that is exactly what Bishop Fillet claims they received. Quote, ordinary Episcopal jurisdiction that can be distinguished from what he calls a supplatory jurisdiction, which is presumably supplied jurisdiction. But he clearly makes a distinction, Don, between supplied jurisdiction, which would never apply to the acts that he just described in, a, in a, an ecclesiastical mm -hmm. tribunal. Okay, it wouldn't apply mm -hmm. to those cases. And we've also said that supplied jurisdiction doesn't even apply to the society. But he's referring right. to... Uh, an Episcopal jurisdiction, which Father McMahon in a video called extraordinary jurisdiction, end quote, which is a contrived and made up theological term that, that that doesn't, there's no such thing as extraordinary jurisdiction. It's either ordinary or supplied. Mm -hmm. But it, but they clarify this even more because Lefebvre and, and Bishop Pelais says Lefebvre believed that it was permitting him in the interests of the faithful, and I'm quoting here, to grant his priest, that is Lefebvre's priest, similar faculties, end quote. And Bishop Fillet also refers to their, quote, added powers and faculties relating to marriage certificates, dispensation from vows, lifting of censures, etc. cetera. Fillet further says, quote, the faculties, and listen to this, the faculties granted to priests, by who? The faculties yeah. granted to priests are not only for priests who are members of the society, but for all priests who reside for a prolonged period of time in our houses, end quote. So Bishop Fillet evidently thinks that as, you know, as long as some priests hang out long enough for the society, they're going to somehow get faculties as well, based upon some Episcopal jurisdiction that exists in these bishops that were illicitly consecrated in 88. When you talk about faculties, Dom, you're talking about uh, something that is conferred by virtue of an office. A bishop, by virtue of his office, has ordinary jurisdiction attached to the office, and it's through his ordinary power that he can then confer faculties upon his inferiors. You see? Well, the society mm -hmm. bishops do not hold offices. They do not have canonical mission. They do not have ordinary jurisdiction, and hence they're not able to confer faculties. And right. when you talk about supply jurisdiction, faculties uh, are different than supply jurisdiction. I mean, jurisdiction is supplied in certain narrow cases, whereas a faculty uh, is his habitual, usually. And it's something yeah. that uh, one possesses by virtue of exercising an office, you see. So as I say to Father Glees, the very words of Archbishop Lefebvre, Bishop Tissier, and Bishop Fillet contradict his statement that Archbishop Lefebvre did not intend to confer jurisdiction because Fillet himself says that they have, quote, ordinary Episcopal jurisdiction and, quote, powers and, quote, faculties and, quote, a true jurisdiction that gives true verdicts that have a, quote, obligatory character and, quote, replace the verdicts of the Roman Rota. 
So we can say a lot more about it, but the society's own words is that they do possess a jurisdiction. And, and by conceding, this is also important, Don, by conceding that jurisdiction can only come from the Pope, and this is what Father Glees does concede, by conceding that jurisdiction only can come from the Holy Father, it proves they're schismatic because they've usurped a jurisdiction that they claim for themselves that didn't come from the Holy Father, and that is not a supplied jurisdiction. It is a yes. fabricated, schismatic jurisdiction that they claim for themselves. So, in other words, for, for the audience here, supplied jurisdiction is something that kicks in in certain instances because of the situation, and this is decreed by the law of the church. Now, faculties is a habitual exercise of a lawful, uh, lawfully sent uh, ecclesiastical uh, person, uh, and uh, so so that's that's the distinction here. Supplied is kicks in because of the the, the law of the church. Uh, faculties means it's an ordinary wielding of that uh, juridical power. Um, but the question really is, where does the society get this jurisdiction it speaks of from? Uh, if it's from the the ordinations, then Father Glees is wrong, and they did usurp from the primacy this jurisdiction. If they don't get it from the ordinations, then uh, they call it what extraordinary jurisdiction, which is a novel category. Uh, so we can talk about ordinary and extraordinary mission, uh, but that's a different conversation. So, yeah, I, I just don't. It's not adding up to me, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, and and sometimes the word faculty might might you know faculty came in with the with the eighty three code. It, it wasn't typically okay. used, you know, a long long time ago. But one could say in the danger of death, a priest, an excommunicated priest, even would have the faculty absolved. So it can be used interchangeably. But okay. in general, it's it's used with with the carrying out of a mission that's attached okay. to an office. Ordinary jurisdiction, Dom. Uh, it, it, and this is this is absolute ordinary jurisdiction is attached to an office. It's generally when a bishop has received canonical mission from the Holy Father. Yeah. Typically, he's he's ruling over a diocese, so he has territorial jurisdiction, ordinary jurisdiction, which then he can delegate certain powers to his inferiors. He, for example, can delegate uh, habitual jurisdiction to uh, an auxiliary bishop, which is not considered ordinary jurisdiction, but it is habitual. He can also grant faculties to his priests all to carry out the mission of the bishop and then ultimately carry out the mission of, of the Holy Father. But so, again, you, your yeah. question of where did the jurisdiction come from? Well, Archbishop Lefebvre told us that. He answered that yeah. question. I've said this before. He says it comes from the people. Yeah. Archbishop Lefebvre said that because of the state of necessity and, and the crisis in the church and the people need the, the society's ministry, it's by their desire for priests and bishops that they then confer upon Archbishop Lefebvre the right to consecrate a bishop. This is exactly what Pius IX and other popes have condemned. They explicitly yes. condemned uh, the the usurpation of a right that belongs to the, the, the primacy by claiming that that right vests somehow or exists in the people, whether it's the right to choose or select a bishop or the right to confer some type of jurisdiction. That right never, under any circumstances, has ever resided in the people, no matter how bad the crisis in the church was. It simply doesn't exist. It is a novelty, and it's a novelty that has been repeatedly condemned by the church. In fact, it's a, it's somewhat of a kind of democratic liberal ecclesiology, really, that it, might, that it comes from the people, uh, which I find interesting. But what I'm, what's interesting here is that from whatever angle you look at it from, these consecrations were unequivocally schismatic. Um, and, and, and the idea that the, the jurisdiction comes from the people, I just wanted to read a passage here from um, uh, then Cardinal Ratzinger's letter to Bishop Lefebvre in uh, 1987 of July 28th. He says, by producing your own interpretation of the text of the magisterium, you would paradoxically display the very liberalism which you have combated so strongly. This is the irony. This, this the yeah. ecclesiology that needs to be adhered to in order to defend these schismatic consecrations is in fact liberal it's in fact you know not traditional which is the irony and which is why we're talking about this so it's totally liberalism and that's the irony of this that the modernists you know and, and the liberals are those on the extreme right you know who contradict the teaching of the church about mission and jurisdiction they, they are the true liberals and mm. i, I want to point this out again uh, quoting father glees because as i've said father glees's article 
puts all of this in, in it, the society's position is now crumbled under its own weight with the admissions of Father Blease. There is nothing left to the society's position. There are no more meaningless distinctions they can be they can hide behind. Father Glee says, quote, to communicate somehow the power of jurisdiction in the church, contrary to the will of the Pope, contradicts a principle of divine right and is therefore a theological yeah. impossibility. And he goes on to say this, Don. He says, quote, no exceptional situation, no extraordinary circumstances could ever legitimize, much less make possible, the communication of the power of jurisdiction against the Pope's will. And so there you go, according to the very standard for schism set forth by Father Glees, Archbishop Lefebvre and the other society bishops are schismatics because they have, by their own words, by their own actions, and by their own admissions, they have arrogated to themselves the divine right here to confer jurisdiction, to assume a type of jurisdiction which only the Pope can provide. Gotcha. Yeah. Um Okay, well, uh, before I recap, try to summarize what you're saying. Is anything, any other quotes, sources, anything else you want to add to this? I think on, on jurisdiction, I think we've, we've covered it. I mean, there, there's more to okay. say here, but again, let's go back to the fundamental principle, which nobody can disagree with. Christ alone shows and sent his apostles, and therefore the vicar of Christ alone chooses and sends the successors of the apostles. That's why this is a matter of divine mm -hmm. law. This is not a matter of human law, canon law, or ecclesiastical law. And as I said over the past couple of years, the society's positions are contrary to divine revelation. This isn't human mm -hmm. law uh, or human positive. This is divine revelation. The law dealing with canonical mission and jurisdiction is been, has been revealed by Christ. The divine constitution of the church has been established by Jesus Christ. There is a primacy. There is an episcopate. Nobody enters the episcopate against the will of the Holy Father, the head of the college. Yes. No, that, that makes sense to me. So let, let's see if I can recap for the audience. Father Glees, in his article, admitted that usurping a right of the primacy is schismatic. But what he, he's trying to say is that the mere possibility because of one's uh, um, uh, sacramental uh, status to consecrate is not the same thing as the giving of jurisdiction. And therefore, since Lefebvre didn't intend to give jurisdiction, he merely intended to consecrate the bishops. That yep. was not schismatic. Now, the fundamental error for number one is that you actually cannot divorce jurisdiction and uh, uh, Episcopal consecration because the very nature of the Episcopate is to wield jurisdiction in communion with the primacy. Right. So that's okay. And, uh, and also... They're separate Lefebvre. steps, right? We acknowledge that okay. there's 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 steps here, right? There has to be the yeah. choosing or selection of a bishop. Then there has to be the Episcopal consecration, which, by the way, is the divine yeah. right of the Pope alone. Now, the Pope can delegate to another bishop the consecration. That's not in dispute. Of course, that happens all the time. But the mm -hmm. right to consecrate that bishop is yeah. with the primacy alone. In fact, the theologians mm -hmm. say that the Pope is the formal efficient cause of all Catholic Episcopal consecrations, even if another bishop is doing the consecrating. The bishop is mm. only a material efficient cause. The Pope is the formal efficient cause of all Catholic Episcopal consecrations because apostolic session, succession and formal apostolic succession is, is perpetuated by the primacy since it rests upon the rock of Peter. You see, so mm -hmm. we're talking about the divine constitution of the church here. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, also, uh, just a second, let's see. Okay, so that makes so there's different steps. There's the selection, there's the ordination, um, and uh, uh, jurisdiction is uh, only in union with the primacy. Now, uh, the SSPX has usurped this right in 1988 and in 1991 because their bishops were not selected by the primacy. Because they, in fact, from their words, intended to confer some kind of jurisdiction, which is an impossibility, uh, and uh, uh, um, and, and they they've continued to uh, exercise, uh, you know, their faculties, which they actually just don't have. So what we have here is a very clear status of schism from the consecration onward, the obstinacy of of the society's ministry, basically. Is that, is that right, John? Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, 
remember Father Glee's attempts to make a distinction between what is theologically impossible and what is theologically yeah. possible, which is an absurdity. He says it's theologically impossible for a bishop to confer jurisdiction. Well, that that's true. But then he goes on to say, but it's theologically possible for a bishop to confer Episcopal orders, and hence it saves itself from schism. But that that's yeah. not true. A, a theological uh, impossibility is not what is not what makes an act schismatic, right? I mean, Luther didn't go around committing theologically impossible acts, and he was still a schismatic. Luther didn't right. attempt to confer jurisdiction and orders and so forth, and yet he was still schismatic because he usurped the right of the primacy, which was mm-hmm. effectively commandeering a mission that he didn't have, which is also right. a divine right of the primacy. So that's you know that that distinction falls completely flat on its face. Okay, yeah. So at the end of the day, this goes back to divine law and not ecclesiastical law. So all of these arguments of us being legalists, I think, just fall short because we're not talking about ecclesiastical law. We're talking about principles of Catholic doctrine that, you know, we're talking about the law of the church. um, Sorry, the divine law of Jesus Christ, which is the way he constituted his church. Okay, so to, to finish off here. Um, so there's, there's been some YouTube responses to our content on the SSPX, uh, you know, and our content is simply the position of the magisterium. Uh, but they've, they've, they've mostly been, you know, John's points are ridiculous, uh, or, uh, we're schismatics for calling out the society or John's changed his mind. So we can't trust him (laughs) or even, or, you know, Lefebvre is holy and God bless the SSPX. So. Uh, we talk about the doctrinal error, right, and the disobedience of the society because we want bishops, priests, and lay people to return to the church. So if someone is out there and you defend the society's position and you think we are wrong, you know, please debate us. Come talk to us and we can hash this out. So that's what I would say. John, any uh, uh, last comments? Well, yeah, I mean, there's there's some other things I, I do want to cover here if I, if I could, Dom. Um, yeah, no, we, we have— up. Yeah, yeah, we I have wanna, plenty of time, John. Okay, Take it wherever wanna, you like. I want to back up what I'm what I'm saying here because we, we dealt with jurisdiction, I think, sufficiently. But I want to I want to show that we are dealing with divine law, and also our claim for divine law here is in response to Father Glees. Father Glees is the one who has raised the issue of divine law in his article, and I'm going to show that right now by quoting from him. He says to communicate, and I'm quoting to quote. To yeah. communicate somehow the power of jurisdiction in the church, contrary to the will of the Pope, contradicts a principle of divine right and is therefore a theological impossibility. On the other hand, communicating the power of order against the against the Pope's will by performing an Episcopal consecration does not contradict a principle of divine right, since divine revelation does not teach that only the Pope can proceed to consecrate a bishop. He goes on to say, quote, divine Mm. right teaches that every bishop can do this since it's a question here of a theological possibility, end Mm. quote. Now, Dom, this is astonishing, again, that an SSPX seminary professor makes this statement. Of course, it's not a divine right for a bishop to communicate the power of order against the Pope's will yeah. The divine law says just the opposite. The truth is right. just the opposite. It's contrary to the divine right of the Pope for a bishop to communicate the power of orders against the pontiff's will. That's a mm-hmm. usurpation of the primacy. And so, as I said, this concession leaves nothing left of the society's position because he's conceded it. He's confused sacramental theology with the ability to communicate Episcopal orders uh, with the divine constitution and ecclesiology, which makes it a, a right of the primacy alone. And I want to point out, if you if you dig into this and you look at what the magisterium is, is taught, and I have a bunch of stuff in my article, a bunch of quotes going back, you know, Pope St. Innocent, uh, Pope St. Gregory the Great, Pius VI, Pius IX, Pius XII, quote after quote, talking about how the right to select bishops Even before we consecrate and give canonical mission, this right to select bishops is a divine right of the primacy. This Mm -hmm. is what obliterates the society's position. This is what exposes their most fundamental error as they've attempted to refine their position. This failure to recognize the right to select is a right of the primacy. And I'll just give you a a few quotes on this. 
Yeah. If you look at Pius the Ninth uh, uh, encyclical Quartus Supra, that's an, uh, uh, an encyclical where he was addressing the illicit consecrations of some of the Eastern schismatics, the, Ar the Armenians, and also Etsy Multa, where he was condemning the illicit consecrations of, of the old Catholics. He repeats throughout that encyclical, for example, quote, he says, the writings of the ancients testify that the election of patriarchs, bishops, has never been considered definitive and valid without the agreement and confirmation of the Roman pontiff, end quote. Mm. Uh, and there's quote after quote after quote about the fact that this is a right that resides exclusively uh, Dom, with the primacy. For example, he goes on to say that, quote, the apostolic authority given to us by the Lord through most holy Peter, prince of the apostles, to appoint bishops, yeah. priests and deacons, etc. So this divine right of the Pope to select who shall be a member of his college of bishops has been given to Peter through Jesus Christ himself. This is why it's a matter of divine law. I'll give you one more quote again from that encyclical. Pius X says, we consider that we should not keep silence our right to elect a bishop apart from the three recommended candidates. He's referring to their ecclesiastical process. And yeah. we should be compelled to exercise this right in the future. And he goes on to say, even if we had remained silent, this right and duty of the see of blessed Peter would have remained unimpaired for, listen to this, for the rights and privileges given to the see by Christ himself. While yeah. they may be attacked, cannot be destroyed. No man has the power to renounce a divine right. He's referring here to the right to, as he said in the beginning, to elect a bishop, end quote. And uh, Pius VI, in his encyclical Caritas a while ago, has another devastating quotation. Pius VI says, quote, for the right of ordaining bishops belongs only, only to the apostolic see, as the Council of Trent declares. It cannot be assumed by any bishop or any metropolitan without obliging us to declare schismatic both those yeah. who ordain and those who are ordained, thus invalidating their future actions. And again, this is why I That's quite said, clear. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crystal clear. I mean, this is why Trent says, whoever says those who haven't been rightly ordained or sent by ecclesiastical mm -hmm. canonical power, but are, you know, come from elsewhere, let them be anathema. This is divine revelation. There's much more to say, Dom. And I would refer no, people yeah. to my article on this if they want the full, you know, the full quotes. Yeah, no, sorry, I, I rushed you. Um, well, I'll include the link to the article in the show notes. And in fact, we did have a, a, a pouring in here of a few questions. Do you want to maybe look at those? Sure. All right, let's pull up some questions here. Um, okay, Marcel asks, John, have you received any response or engagement of your criticism from SSPX adherents? Yeah, an unwillingness to debate the issues. Okay. <laughs> uh, Colin asks, uh, if Lefebvre intended not to confer jurisdiction prior to his schismatic consecrations, did that constitute a direct contrary intention to the sacramental effect? No, the popes have always acknowledged that uh, even a schismatic bishop can confer the sacramental character in Episcopal yeah. consecration. And that's why it's so dangerous because right. Lefebvre was now not perpetuating apostolic succession for the Roman Catholic Church, but he was perpetuating succession for his own organization, which is not part right. of the Roman Catholic Church. Gotcha. Makes sense. Um, let's see. Hansa asks, um, oh, sorry, that was not a question, but I appreciate the comments. Um, here it is, Mark. Mark asks, are declarations of nullity from SSPX tribunals invalid, therefore making any subsequent marriage invalid? That's a good question. Absolutely invalid. They have no authority to make any what Bishop Tissier calls true verdicts with an obligatory character. That's utterly absurd. Right. And also be advised that even though Francis has delegated faculties for them to witness marriages, those faculties depend upon the approval of the local ordinary. And I have actually talked to society priests and have asked them, if you guys don't get approval from the local ordinary, what do you guys do? And you know what they say? 
we do the marriages anyway, okay? Which again yeah. shows a very schismatic attitude. There's no docility toward the ordinary there. Um, that's why these marriages, if again, they're not approved by the local ordinary are invalid as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it looks like that's all the questions. Um, anything you want to add in conclusion, John? Well, you know, I want to say, I feel like I'm speaking to, you know, my friends, my, my traditional Catholic friends here. Um, yeah, I, you know, I feel your pain. I oppose, you know, restrictions on the traditional mass. I, I may feel st more strongly about that than even you do, Don. I do oppose it. And mm -hmm. I do think we should resist and fight to save to save that mass. But two wrongs don't make a right. Okay, that, mm -hmm. that's, that's the point here. Um, as much as I love the traditional mass, I, I can't use it as a banner to, you know, to weaponize my position to somehow justify my separation from the church. That's what's going yeah. on here. And that's what's the biggest concern. As I've always said, I'm trying to keep Catholics in the church and I'm trying to bring the society people into the church and the society clergy in the church. As I've yeah. said them all along, Catholics who have been scandalized and, and many of them are actually, you know, newbie traditionalists that's come, come into this, that discovered the beauty of tradition and the beauty of the of the old mass have become so scandalized that they have now unfortunately uh, equated those who hold the true catholic faith with those who simply go to the traditional mass right mm -hmm. without regard to ecclesiastical unity without mm -hmm. regard to the fact that we have to profess our faith in union with the bishop we have to worship in union with the bishop and we have to be subject to the ecclesiastical governance of the bishop. That's what makes us Catholic, not a particular missal or particular sacramental uh, here and there. And so yeah. we, we need to shore this up and understand that while, you know, there are forces of evil fighting both, you know, outside and inside the church, we have to remain in the bark of Peter. We have to fight this battle in the church. And mm -hmm. it comes down to, to dogma, Don. This comes down to Catholic yeah. teaching. How much do these society adherents really care about Catholic doctrine? You know, this puts the, you know, this is where the rubber meets the road, guys. If you are a Catholic and you believe in doctrine and your traditions and your, your beliefs are doctrinal, here you go. One of the fundamental doctrines of the church is the primacy and the right of the Pope to select and determine bishops. Okay. Yeah. That right was usurped by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre and the society bishops and Bishop Rangel in 1991. This is about as serious as it can get, because other than someone Dom declaring themselves a pope, an anti-pope, consecrating a bishop against the will of the Holy Father, Father is 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 one of the most direct attacks on the unity of the church that can possibly exist. That's why this is so critical. And that's why this is the this is the demarcation between being a Catholic and being a schismatic. So God yeah. willing, people will, will wake up to these issues, to the doctrine of the church and remain in the church and come back to the church. Excellent. Thank you so much, John. Um, uh, audience, make sure you like uh, this uh, video, subscribe, hit that notification bell, comment down below, be civil. Um, and if you want to support us, you can support us at patreon.com slash the logos project. And uh, John, thanks again for coming on. Excellent uh, episode as usual. And uh, we'll see you guys next time.